Hi everyone and welcome back to AP Computer Science. I'm Mr. Linneberger and today we're going to be talking about for loops and assignment operators. The presentation today we're going to be talking about the assignment operators, what they are, and how we can use them to kind of shorten things up for us a little bit. We're going to be introducing the for statement in Java and we're going to be talking about the similarities and differences between our for and while loops and talk about how to create for loops. There are several different types of assignment statements that we use as programmers quite frequently, such as num equals num plus one, our basic incrementer, x equals x minus five, uh, decrementer, or the product or prod equals prod times three, or any sort of statement like this where we are assigning a variable some arithmetic property uh, either adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, modulus of itself. And because these types of assignments are made so frequently, most programming languages have assignment operators to shorten these statements down for us. So let's take a look at these three particular statements. And so these statements are kind of our long assignment statements, the statements that we've been using thus far. So we can see that num equals num plus one can be shortened down into num plus equals one. All right, this is our addition assignment operator. X equals x minus five can be shortened down into x minus equals five. And that's our subtraction assignment operator. Prod equals prod times three can be shortened to prod times equals three, which is our multiplication assignment operator. Both versions of these assignments do exactly the same thing. They're both taking the old version of num, adding one to it, and assigning it to the variable number. All right, this is just kind of a, a shortcut to save some time. All right, using these shorter assignment operators is just a matter of preference. There's really no benefit other than it's a little less typing. Um, and in fact, most of the time for cases like this, I tend to still use the long way of doing it just because I feel it's a little more explicit and it makes the code a little bit easier for me to read through. Um, and arguably there's two types of op assignment statements that happen all the time um, and that's our increase and decrease by one statements. So foo equals foo plus one and bar equals bar minus one. Because these statements are used so frequently, uh, there's an even shorter shortcut operator called the increment and decrement operators. So foo equals foo plus one can be shortened down to foo plus plus. All right, the plus plus operator is exactly the same thing as taking the old value of foo, adding one to it, and reassigning it to foo. That plus plus operator does all of that. And similar, in a similar manner, we have our decrement operator. If we're just wanting to subtract one, we can just do our minus minus operator to our variable. Again, both of these do exactly the same thing and using them is a matter of preference. Um, I will tend to use the plus plus and minus minus operators, especially in for loops as you're gonna see in a little bit. But again, it's really just a matter of preference. Use the plus plus if you want, or use foo equals foo plus one if you want. All right, so here's kind of our shortcut operator list. We have our basic assignment operator, um, our addition assignment operator, the plus equals, our subtraction, our multiplication assignment operator. There's a division assignment operator. There is our remainder assignment operator. Um, there is, and then there is our um, incrementer operator and our decrementer operator as well. And again, really use these if you want to use these. Use these if you feel comfortable using them. Um, most of the time, like I said, most of the time I will use the plus plus and minus minus. But if I'm doing these, it's really not saving all that much time. And I just think the code looks nicer with stuff written out like this versus this. Uh, but that's just my personal preference 
And again, feel free to use any of those if you want to use them. All right, so what I want you to do is take a moment, pause the video or whatnot, and try and predict what this loop is going to output. Is this what you predicted? Because if you did, it was wrong. Remember the trick here, we gotta be real careful. What does our power method in the math class actually return? It returns a double value. So our actual output is gonna end up looking like this. All right. But here again, the whole looping thing, hopefully you're able to get that. But just please remember, this is just kind of a, a good thing for the AP test to remember. Um, always kind of be cognizant of what the return value of specific methods are and how that's going to affect your outcome. Okay, so let's take a look at this loop and just review our basic looping components. All right, every loop we need a starting value, somewhere that the loop is going to start at. Every loop needs a stopping point or a loop while or keep doing this until kind of point. Um, every loop is going to have some sort of action that we need to take, the whole purpose of our looping. And every loop is going to have some way of eventually adjusting the value that we're checking for. All right, in this case, it's an incrementer. So today we're going to be talking about the for loop, and the for loop is a way of organizing all of these important pieces, the starting value, the stopping point, and the increment, all into kind of one neat, compact header. So with the while loop, we have to have separate statements for our starting value, where we're looping until or while we're looping, and our incrementer, the for loop, we can put those all together into a statement that looks like this. So this code over on the right is going to be doing exactly what our while loop code on the left is doing. All right, so first of all, we're establishing a starting value. We're creating our exponent variable, our x variable, and setting it equal to 1, just like we did established our starting variable here in the while loop. Next thing we're establishing the stopping point. All right, we're going to keep looping until or while x is less than or equal to 10, just like we established in our while loop. The next thing we're going to do is define our increment or decrement amount, just like we did over in the while loop. All right, but the one thing you'll notice with the for loop is our starting value, our loop while we're doing this value, and our increment value are all put in that initial header statement. Whereas with our while loop, the only thing that went in the header of our while was the actual Boolean check. All right, and then finally we have the actual action. So with our for loop, the body of the for loop is just going to be our action steps. All right, so our for loop has two components. It's got the loop header, and it's got the loop body. And again, the body is really just whatever we're going to be doing. The whole reason we need a loop. It's our action stuff. So the main meat of the for loop is going to be up here in the for header. So let's talk about the for header. The for header, you can see, is split into three separate statements. We have our initialization statement, our expression, our Boolean expression statement, and our update statement, or our increment decrement statement. So the initialization statement, that st sets the starting value of the increasing, or the incrementing, or decrementing variable. Um, the variable that's used in here is only going to exist while the for loop is running. So, whereas with our while loop, we could call, uh, let me go back. With our while loop here, we could actually call after this while loop is run, 
I could output the value of EXP and get an actual value there. All right, with our for loop, that is not the case. All right, with the for loop, the variable that we define in our initialization, it goes away. It gets cleared from memory um, once the for loop is done executing. So it's actually going to throw an error if we try and print out exp uh, after the for loop is done executing. Our expression. All right, this is setting how long our loop is going to run for. This is going to be exactly the same thing that we would have used inside that loop while statement. And finally, the update. The update sets how the incrementer or decrementer will be changing at the end of every loop. All right, a lot of times it's going to be a plus plus or a minus minus. We're just going to be adding one or subtracting one. But we could do exp equals exp plus 5 if we want to add 5 every time. You can do multiplication. You can do division in here. You can do any sort of arithmetic expression for your update. Um, but most of the time, like I said, for the for loops, it's going to be a simple adding or subtracting a constant amount. The update to the, increment, the incrementer or decrementer happens after the for loop body has finished executing, but before the expression is checked again. So it's when we get to the very bottom, that last ending curly brace of our for loop, our loop body, that's when our increase or decrease, our increment or decrement actually happens, which is different with our while statement. Remember, in our while loops, we can control when that increment or decrement happens because we have to manually code that in. With the for loop, it happens automatically immediately before our expression is checked again. So it runs through the loop body. Once we hit that last curly brace, then our update runs, and then it loops back up to the top and checks our condition again. All right, for example, uh, write a for loop that's gonna print out the numbers from one to 20. So try and figure this one out on your own. So pause the video for a minute and see if you couldn't write this one out. Okay, let me talk through my thinking here. So we need to figure out our starting point. We need to figure out how long you're, we're gonna be looping. And we need to figure out what our update value is gonna be. How are we gonna be updating our in incrementer each time? Uh, pretty clear in this case we're going to be starting at 1. We're going to be looping while um, until we get to 20, including 20. So we're going to be looping while we are less than or equal to 20. And our update, we want each number, so we're just going to be adding 1 each time. So we should end up with a for statement that looks something like 4 um, in n equals 1. So we initialize our for loop variable n. Um, we're going to loop until our loop while n is less than or equal to 20. And we are going to update our n by adding 1 to it every time. And then our loop body is just going to be this plain old printing out our n, var n value, our loop variable. So we get something like that. Um, hopefully you got something similar. And I just want to show you the basics of a code trace for our for loop. And the basics of the code trace is going to work exactly how it does for a while loop. All right, we have our check n is less than or equal to 20. We have our variable n. If I could spell, we have our output value. All right, so in the initialization phase, all right, we're checking um, n becomes 1. That's our start. So it's going to run through and it's initializing this and it does actually check this first expression before it runs the loop body. All right, The loop body is not guaranteed to run at all um, because if we fail this uh, the for loop will just break and continue on with the rest of the program. So we're going to check 1 is less than or equal to 20 that is true. 
All right, so then what's it going to do? It enters into the loop. It prints out the value of n, which is 1. It hits the end of the loop, and now is where the update happens. Okay, so now is where n changes to 2. And then we loop back up to the 4, and we check 2 is less than or equal to 20. Yes, that's true. So it runs the loop body. The loop body is going to output 2. It hits the end of the for loop. So then our update happens, our update is 3, and hopefully you can kind of see the cycle from here. So take a look at this second example. It's a little more complex. I'm going to work this one in BlueJ. But we want to print out, we want to make a for loop that's going to print out all the multiples of 7 between 1 and 400, and printing 5 multiples per row. So we're going to have print 5 numbers per row just to make things a little more compact for us. So let's talk about how we can do this. So let's talk about the three things that we need for our loop here, at least for our loop control. Our starting point, our loop while, how long are we going to loop, and what we're going to update our incrementer by each time. So if we're printing out the multiples of 7 from 1 to 400, uh, let's just start with the first multiple of 7, which is 7. So that seems like a logical starting place. Uh, loop while, we're going to keep going until we hit 400. So as long as we are less than or equal to 400, we're going to keep on looping. And if we're just printing out multiples of 7, I guess there's a couple of different ways we could do this. I think the easiest way that I can think to doing it is if we start out with a multiple of 7 and we want another multiple of 7, we can just add 7 every time. So we'll go from 7 to 14 to 21 and so on. So with this now we have enough information to write our loop header, our for loop header. So let's say for int, um, I'll just call this one i, and we want to start it at 7. So int i equals 7. We're going to loop as long as i is less than or equal to 400. And we are going to be updating our i by i equals i plus 7 each time. So inside our loop body, all right, if we did this, this will print out one multiple per row. And we can just make sure our there we go. So we got all of our multiples of seven, but we wanted to print them out five per row. So let's think about how we could do this. Um, So let me just make a variable that's going to store. This is just going to count. The variable count is just going to store how many multiples of 7 we've already printed. Um, so if I come in here and let's... Let's just add a tab in here. And if we want to print multiple things per line, we can do it this way. Let's see what happens when we run it like this. Now we should just get a whole long list of all of our multiples in a single row um, tabbed over. All right. Now, how can we figure out after we've done five, we want to do a new line? So after we've printed out one, let's add one to count. All right, so count's going to be getting bigger by one each time we print out a multiple. 
and then we can check We can check if the remainder of count divided by 5 is 0. That means that we have printed out some multiple of 5. And so if we've already printed out 5, then we should just print out a new line. And if my logic is correct, I think this should do the trick. This should do the trick, and there we go. So we got nice columns of five. So that's a nice handy way of printing out a set number of things.